want to welcome you in Jesus' name on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. Even if it wasn't beautiful weather, we have reason to be here to rejoice in the goodness that God has provided for us in the death and resurrection of our Savior. Our call to worship today comes from Matthew's account of the resurrection, Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you on this day to be able to come and worship a living, risen Lord and Savior, one who rules and reigns. And I pray, Lord, that you would rule and reign. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the empty tomb, especially. I invite you to stand as we begin to worship this morning.
You may be seated. Our confession of sin is taken from Psalm 86. Would you bow with me as we together confess our sin? Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. We rejoice in that uh, promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our scripture reading is taken from John's account of the resurrection, John chapter 20, and reading verses 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Would you join me in confessing our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship this morning. Rereading from our call to worship this morning, Matthew 28 says, But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He's not here. He is risen. I believe in the Son. I believe in the risen one. I believe I power of his blood. 
1 Peter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created.
risen and reigning Savior. Amen. You may be seated. And that changes everything, doesn't it? We serve a risen, reigning, and coming Lord and Savior, Jesus. We have read from several of the gospel accounts this morning. We turn to Luke chapter 24 and read verses 1 through 12. Luke chapter 24, reading verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. They remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Let's bow in prayer. We sing hallelujah today, Lord Jesus, because you are the one who has died. You are the one who has risen from the dead. You are the one that gives us hope today in a world that desperately needs some hope. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, for all that you've done. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would take now the word that we have read, the word that has been given by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And Father, would you use it today to, to strengthen us, to challenge us, to encourage us, to remind us of all that you've done for us. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We say that the foundation of a good education is the three R's, right? Reading and writing and arithmetic. I wonder if we have an issue with our foundation of reading, right? Because only one of these words actually starts with an R. Reading, of course, writing starts with a W and arithmetic starts with an A. So maybe we need to get back to some of the basics, right, and really know what words start with, with an R. Well, there are three words that we find in this passage of Scripture that really illustrate what ought to be our response to the good news of the resurrection. We find those three words in verses 8 and 9, and if you're good at phonics, you'll know what they are, right? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported these things to the eleven and to the rest. So there is the outline of our message today. Don't go to sleep, though, because I want to tell you something about these three words. Remember, and then, what are the other three? I forgot already. Remember, return, and report. That's what it's like when you get old. Notice, first of all, we need to remember... Jesus' word, because he is faithful to his promises. If you've been blessed with a good memory, unlike me, um, you can be thankful for that because you can avoid the trouble that comes when you forget something that is important. Any of you have ever forgotten something that's really important? I think we all have. I remember reading about a man, get this, ladies, a man who forgot he was married. He went home after work to mom and dad's house and walked in the door and said, what are you doing here? Oh, that's right. I'm married. <laughs> so 
off he went home. Now, you can probably get by with missing your wife's birthday or anniversary without dying, but if you forget you've been married, you are in big trouble. You can get in trouble if you forget something important. Or a pastor I know of who forgot a funeral. He was at the visitation the night before and visiting with the family. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. Guess what? He didn't show up. And here they were gathered at the funeral home. The funeral director is getting very nervous. And there happened to be a pastor that he saw walking on the street. He opened the door and grabbed him and said, you got to help me. Can you imagine that? Being brought into this funeral. You don't know probably anybody, and you're supposed to get up there, lead this funeral sermon, preach a message. I wonder what he said. Wow. You can get in trouble if you forget something important. The women who came to Jesus' tomb that Easter morning, that first Easter morning, were troubled because they forgot something important. How many times did Jesus say that he was going to die and then rise again? Repeatedly, he mentioned this, and, and yet it seems like they, they didn't get it. They didn't remember it. It's like it went in one ear and out the other. And because they didn't remember, they experienced some unnecessary trouble, didn't they? The sorrow that they experienced that day was needless sorrow. If they had remembered that Jesus was going to rise again, they would not have been grieving that day. They would have not have been coming to this tomb to anoint what they thought would be a dead body there. Mary Magdalene wouldn't have been weeping outside the tomb. In fact, there would have been no reason for them to even go to the cemetery. Why go to the tomb if Jesus said he was going to rise again? So unnecessary sorrow... And how about unnecessary confusion? Luke tells us that the women were perplexed, that they didn't find the body of Jesus in the tomb, and had they remembered that, that wouldn't have been an issue. I find it interesting how the, the angels uh, gave kind of a gentle rebuke to these women. Verse 4 says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. That's a good way to describe it, right? Dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, good question, why do you seek the living one among the dead? Why are you looking for Jesus here? He is not here. He is risen. And then this word, remember. Remember. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, telling you that the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He will be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then verse 9 says, and they remembered his words. Kind of like the light bulb just went on, right? Ah, that's right. They remembered his words. And they realized that they were sad and confused when there was absolutely no reason for that because Jesus was going to and had risen from the dead. I read about a service that took place in, in Bangladesh. It was a Good Friday service and it was packed. There were little children sitting in the aisles and up in the front of the church and they were watching the Jesus film. Now, do you remember that, the Jesus film? And as it got to the point of the crucifixion, people were weeping. And gasps of unbelief were heard as they saw this, this Messiah being crucified on a cross. And, and they were just like feeling the agony of, of the cross and, and their disappointment, and the disappointment of the disciples. And said, in that moment, there was young, one young boy who cried out, he says, don't be afraid. He gets up again. I saw it. <laughs> That's what the angels were saying to the women. Don't be afraid. He gets up. He's risen. He's alive. No reason for you to be afraid. Now we need to ask the question, was there anyone who remembered that Jesus said he would rise again? The women didn't, right? The disciples didn't. Was there anyone who remembered that Jesus said he would rise again? 
Yes. And you might be surprised who it was. You go back to Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember. What did they remember? We remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'm going to rise again. So the only ones that remembered were the opponents of Jesus, and so they gave orders to have the grave made secure, right? Yeah, right. Make the grave secure so that Jesus could not rise from the dead? What a laughable story. So Pilate said, if you have a guard, you go make it as secure as they know. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So the only ones who, re- who seemed to remember anyhow that Jesus said he would rise again were the opponents of Jesus. Let's make this grave secure. Otherwise, the disciples are going to come. They're going to steal the body away. And they're going to say that Jesus rose from the dead. Really? They didn't get the resurrection yet. What a foolish thought that they would come and and steal the body of Jesus. Remember what he said. And if you look at the structure of this whole chapter in Luke, chapter 24 you'll notice that the emphasis in this whole chapter is remembering what God said. Those two on the road to Emmaus, remember those guys? They're walking along and they're downcast and and Jesus comes and walks alongside them and says, what's your problem, boys? Not quite like that, but you know what I mean? And well, we were hoping that this Jesus was going to be, oh. So what did Jesus say to them? In Luke 24, 25, he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He took him back to the scriptures. This is what the word of God said. Don't be foolish. Don't be slow of heart. You need to remember this. You need to believe all that has been written in the prophets. And then Jesus, that evening, he comes to his disciples. They're, of course, hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. And he said to them in verse 44, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. So in all three sections of this chapter, what's the focus? It's on the word. You need to remember what God said in his word. And that's the challenge for us, isn't it? We need to get back to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? And if we stand on the promises of God's Word, it will make a difference, a significant difference in the way that we live. It'll help us when our circumstances don't make sense, right? It will help us when we are focusing on what we might see with our eyes instead of what God says in His Word. Think of the women. What did they see with their eyes, right? Well, the body is not there. What's going on here? They were perplexed, Luke says. Seemed to say that Jesus was dead. His body had been put somewhere. That's what Mary Magdalene says. We we don't know where they laid his body. But God's word said otherwise. God's word said otherwise. From the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, from the mouth of Jesus himself, God's sure promise that Jesus would rise again. And that's what we need to stand upon today, the truth of God's word. I remember coming to a burial one time, and there was a sign that said cemetery, so I took the turn. And when I took the turn, there was another sign that said no outlet. And I said to myself, 
That's fake news. <laughs> That's fake news. Now, if I would have relied on what I'd seen with my eyes, rather than what God's Word has to say, I would have been pretty discouraged. Just so you know, there is an outlet out of the cemetery. It's found in Jesus. It was a, he, he got out of that empty, he got out of that tomb, and one day, what did he say? A day is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, right? You know, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it's a good thing he said just Lazarus, because if he would have said, come forth, the whole world would have come forth. That's the power of his word. Remember, Jesus' word. He is faithful to his promises. And that's why we need to be in the word every day. I hope the only time you get the word isn't on Sunday. I hope you got a daily feeding in the word. Remembering the promises of God. That'll change your life. That'll change your life. So remember, there's the first R. The second R is return. Return from Jesus' tomb because he is risen from the dead. So once the women realized that Jesus had risen from the tomb, from the dead, they returned from the tomb. They left the tomb. There was no reason for them to stay there, right? Why would you stay there? Jesus' body was gone. He had risen from the dead. It was time to leave this place of death, this place of sorrow, and never return because Jesus was alive. I find no um, record in the New Testament that they ever went back to that tomb. Now sometimes we go and we visit, right, where uh, relatives have died and we remember their lives and so forth. Jesus' disciples never went back to that tomb because he was alive. Why would they go there? So they left. They returned from the tomb, it says. I remember uh, a story about Martin Luther's wife. Um, evidently, Luther was going through uh, some kind of a struggle, and he was discouraged. And, and so she gets up one morning, and she's dressed in black. And Luther says, why are you dressed in black? Did someone die? And she says, yep. He says, who died? She said, God did. He said, what do you mean, God did? He said, the way you're living around here, it's as though God is dead. I think Luther got the point, right? Are you living your life as if Jesus is still in the grave? Are you living your life as if he has not risen from the dead? You know, many people today live as if Jesus is still in the grave. Because they live in the cemetery of spiritual death. They might be physically alive, but they are spiritually dead. And they might come on Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection, but if they don't know Jesus, they are, they're physically alive, but they're spiritually dead. They don't understand what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. Verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So if, if you are in Jesus today... You have been raised to a new life, spiritual life, newness of life. John 5, 24, Jesus puts it this way, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life out of spiritual death into spiritual life. And what happens when you pass out of death to life? Your life is different. Your life is changed. 
You become a new creation in Jesus. You have new desires, new purpose, new goals. <laughs> you want to be in the word. You want to be in the fellowship of God's people. You want to worship Jesus. That's what happens when you've been given spiritual life. And Jesus is the only one who can give you spiritual life. So are you walking in newness of life today? Because Jesus is alive? And then there are others who live as if Jesus is still in the grave because they have no hope beyond the grave. They have no hope of a future resurrection. They don't know what it means, what we sung about this morning, of that living hope. That when death comes, to be brought into the very presence of Jesus. That's the living hope. And so many people do not know what that is. And so how do they deal with death? You know, one of the ways they try to deal with that, they come up with all kinds of strange ideas about death. How about this one? Death is just a natural part of life. Have you heard that one before? That is so wrong. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. <laughs> It is our enemy, and Jesus defeated. Death is not a natural part of life. How many times have you heard someone say, Dad, I know you're still with me. Really? Where is he? He's not here anymore. I mean, all these things that people say, well, when Mommy died, she became an angel. Where do you find that in Scripture? I mean, all these ways to try to deal with, with death, coming up with silly things. I remember when my father died and the funeral director came in and I suppose he was trying to be say something nice you know, my mom had died in January this was March Upper Peninsula of Michigan do you bury it then? no you don't because there's all kinds of snow and so my mom was in the, the vault at the cemetery and, and the funeral director he said we're going to put your dad right by your mom. I thought, oh, I bet you they'll hold hands, huh? Right? We're going to put your dad right by your mom. Oh, I was so enraged. No, I wasn't. I was just like, you know, like, that is not what comforts me that my mom and dad are going to be side by side in the cemetery vault. What comforts me is that they are with Jesus together today because of the resurrection. That's the living hope we have. That's a living hope. It doesn't die when we die. In some churches today, you won't hear about this living hope. There are preachers who do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And I ask myself, what on earth are you doing in ministry, if you do not believe that Jesus died and rose again. R. Kent Hughes says, all resurrection-denying churches look for Jesus among the dead. They love the example of Jesus. They preach his courage, his conviction, even his faith. Sentimentality fills their sermons with language about recurrent spring, making hope eternal about a butterfly discarding its chrysalis. But R. Kent Hughes says, but the R word is never used except metaphorically. Yeah. If you come to this church, you're going to hear the R word. Because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We believe in the resurrection because we have no other message to proclaim that is worth proclaiming. If Jesus has not risen, why would we even want to be here today? Just a social club? He is alive. And that ought to make a difference in the way that we live. And if it doesn't make a difference in the way that you live, there's something wrong. Have you passed from death into life? Do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? Do you serve a risen Savior today? I trust you do. So return from Jesus' tomb because he is risen from the dead. And then the third word is the word report. Report 
Jesus' resurrection because he must be made known. Notice that. They remembered his words, and then they returned from the tomb, and they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, if you compare this with Matthew's account, the angel said, go quickly. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Can't you just picture that? Scared because they had seen these angels, and, and yet joyful because Jesus had risen, and they're just racing. And I wonder who was the fastest. Peter was the slower of the, uh, of the disciples. I, that always bugged me. Because I'm Peter, and I, you need, Peter's want to win, right? Peter wanted to win, uh, but John beat him there. But, so these women were, were running, and you can't help but see the, the sense of urgency. Go quickly. Tell whom? The disciples. Tell the disciples that Jesus is risen. They they needed to know that, didn't they? Where were they? Hiding. What were they wondering? Would they be next? They needed to know that Jesus was alive because they would be the ones that were given that great commission, right? Go and make disciples of all the nations. They needed to be convinced that Jesus was alive. And that's not the only thing that the women were told to tell the disciples. Not just that Jesus was risen, but you go to Galilee, and there you're going to see him. You will see him. The angel said that in Matthew 28, verse 7, and then Jesus meets them, and he says the same thing. He says, don't be afraid. Take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, for there they will see me. Why did Jesus want them to see him? He knew these men, didn't he? He knew what doubters they were. How many times did he say, oh, you of little faith, Have you no faith, he said to them one time. And so they were doubting, and Jesus met them in their time of doubt by coming to them. And and, see, look at my hands. Look at my side. It's it's me. And not only that, but but Luke tells us in Acts chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs many, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. So not only were the the women eyewitnesses of the resurrection, these apostles were, and just think of those days, those 40 days when Jesus was appearing before them. I don't know how many times he did that, but he was teaching them and, and, and instructing them and encouraging them. And if you read through the book of Acts, I'll tell you what, these guys' lives were changed, weren't they? You think of Peter before that? I'll stand with you, Jesus. I don't know about the rest of these guys, but you can count on me. And Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And he did. And then you, you see him in the book of Acts, and you ask the question, is this the same Peter? Yes and no. (laughs) It's the same guy, but he's a changed man. The the resurrection power of Jesus. He stood up to those Sanhedrin, right? Read through the book of Acts and see the boldness. How God had transformed their lives through the power of the resurrection. So they saw him. They heard him. They touched him. And Jesus changed them in a marvelous way. I received a letter from Evangelist Luis Palau. Does that make me sound important? It was a form letter. There were others that got it too. But (laughs) A few weeks ago, I got that letter. It was dated March the 1st. 
And Luis Palau died on March the 11th. And here's what he said. Here's how he starts the letter. He said, more than likely, this is the last letter you will ever receive from me. If the doctors are right, I'm days away from glory, and I feel it. All medication stopped, at home with Pat on palliative care, family close by, it's just a matter of days. My time here on earth is done. And when you read through that letter, there are two things that are so clearly on his heart. Can't miss it. The first thing he emphasizes is that he faced eternity with confidence. He said, I'm excited for heaven. I truly am. I know where I'm going. That's because Frank Chandler shared the gospel with me when I was 12 years old. I'll never forget that night. Sitting in the rain at summer camp, he shared the gospel with me clearly, boldly, and lovingly, and he gave me an opportunity to respond. It was that night when I accepted Christ into my life and began to serve him. And it is because of that decision that I know I will close my eyes to this world and open them to glory, to the face of my Savior. There was no crossing fingers and saying, boy, I sure hope I make it. I hope I've done enough good things. He said, I know that. Why? Because of Jesus and what Christ had done for him. The second thing he emphasized is that those of us who remain have a mission to fulfill. He says, in the meantime, I can't encourage you enough. Stay the course. Don't give up the fight. Stand strong for the gospel. Share the good news unashamedly. And then he says, and be sure to do all you can to bring as many people with you to glory. What a way to end the race. With confidence that when my day comes, that this body gives out, he says, I know I'm going to open up my eyes and see Jesus. That's the way to live, isn't it? And that's the way you can live when you know Jesus. And then to say, you who remain, stand fast, stay the course, proclaim the good news unashamedly, and bring as many people with you as you can. Why? Because of the resurrection, right? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when we've experienced the power of the resurrection, like Luis Palau did, that's how it will impact our lives. We know where we're going, and we want to take as many people with us along the way. The resurrection changes everything. It changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead will make a difference and how you live, and it'll make a difference in how you die. Clearly, it will. Many years ago, I was shaking hands at the door at another church I served on Easter Sunday. And there was a man that came through the door. His name was Ferdinand. And Ferdinand spoke very slowly, very deliberately, but he loved Jesus and he put out his hand to me. He said, Pastor, I am ready to meet Jesus whenever he calls me home. And then he paused for just a minute. And he said, and those aren't just words. And I said, Ferdinand, praise God for that. The phone rang that afternoon. Guess what? Ferdinand met Jesus that day, Easter Sunday. And when I spoke at Ferdinand's funeral, do you think I quoted him? Absolutely I did. And I challenged the family, I challenged the people that were there at that service, is that your testimony? That I'm ready to meet Jesus whenever he calls me home? 
And those aren't just words. <laughs> That's the reality in my life. If you can't say that today, I want you to meet someone. I want you to meet Jesus. The one who died for you, the one who rose again for you, the one who longs to be a part of your life, the one who calls you, invites you to come to him today. I can't think of a better day to come to Jesus than on Easter Sunday, can you? What better day to pass from spiritual death to spiritual life on Easter Sunday? And maybe some of you have experience that in your life, but you've backslidden. You're not walking with Jesus today. What better day to renew that commitment to Jesus than today than, and experience a renewed relationship with Him? The resurrection changes everything. And when you know Jesus, your life will change. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. And we remember your words today. We remember the words of the prophets, of Moses, the Psalms, that tell us that you died and rose again. And it was necessary for our salvation, and we rejoice in that. And Father, help us to report that good news to those around us, that many more may come to know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. We love you today because you first loved us. Help us to go that on our way rejoicing in, in, in what price you paid for us, the victory that you won for us, that is ours by faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song.
would you receive the benediction? Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you.